start on time. So I, I'm really happy to introduce today uh, Tom Green, um, someone who it's very, it, it's usual for me to say Dr. So-and-so, but Tom Green, who's a lawyer. And um, he specializes, he's from Boston, he specializes in complex civil litigation, um, and he's been doing this for more than 30 years. For the past 14, almost 15 years. This is amazing. And I, I told him last night this is like our own research projects. Um, he's been working on litigation against Pfizer for off-label and fraudulent promotion of the drug Neurontin, and its generic name is gabapentin. He's going to talk to us about um, a whistleblower case that culminated a few years back in a $430 million settlement and a recent fraud case uh, where he represented Kaiser Health Plan against Pfizer, and that resulted in a $147 million uh, jury verdict um, for fraud uh, and promotion of uh, fraudulent promotion of Neurontin. So um, he's going to give us uh, some blow-by-blow blow, uh, about what happened and how this is important for us in public health. So I'll turn it over to Tom. Hi, everyone. I uh, talked to Kay. Uh, she invited me to come down. I, I said I was going to be, you know, in the area, meaning flying over um, uh, Baltimore. I think she took it to be that uh, I was going to be actually stopping. But I was delighted and, and so happy to do this, to come down uh, to give this uh, presentation for Kay. Uh, I think so much of her and uh, uh, so highly of her and Swarup uh, and the, the assistance, which I'm going to talk about uh, a little bit later, uh, that she provided in doing some analysis of uh, internal research reports uh, that uh, Pfizer had in comparing them to uh, journal articles that was supposed to accurately report uh, the science. And we'll get into that in a, in a few moments. I'm going to try to leave uh, about 20 minutes at the conclusion of my talk to take any questions. But if you, if you have questions, if, if I use a term or something and, and you don't understand it, please stop me and, and, I'll, and I'll try to answer the question. Um, so I wanted to talk about these two cases. This case that I've been working on uh, litigation against Pfizer and Warner Lambert. Uh, Warner Lambert owned uh, Park Davis, the company that developed Neurontin, uh, Gabapentin. I've been working on this litigation for going on 15 years now. And the, the way this got started is a sales representative came into my office in July of 1996. And he had been working, he was a PhD, and he'd be working at uh, Park Davis for about uh, four months. And he felt uncomfortable because they were asking him uh, and his colleagues to promote Neurontin off-label. And I think, as many of you uh, may know, it's illegal for a drug company to promote a drug off-label. Um, I, I think you're all familiar with the FDA approval process. A drug manufacturer is required uh, to get FDA approval before they can market or promote a drug. Uh, they have to produce all their clinical trial evidence to the FDA when they seek approval. And if they want to go, get, go back and, and market it for a new indication, they have to, you know, conduct the, the DBRCTs, submit it to the FDA, uh, and, and get approval. Neurontin was approved in um, December 1993. This is 1994, but December 1993 as adjunctive therapy for epilepsy. And they launched the, the beginning of 1994 to market it uh, for therapy uh, for epilepsy patients. And they had a, window, a limited window of opportunity. The patent was due to expire in 1998. I'm going to show you an internal document in a few moments. Uh, they projected lifetime sales for the FDA-approved use of $500 million. Uh, so how did this drug grow to be a blockbuster, meaning sales in excess of a billion dollars? And you'll see in a minute, uh, they had a couple of years where it exceeded $2 billion a year. And the way they did it is an illegal uh, program where they hired advertising agencies and medical marketing writing firms that wrote journal articles or assisted in the development of journal articles to promote Neurontin for off-label uses. Um, <clears throat> so back to Dr. Franklin. Uh, when he came to us, I didn't know what off-label meant. 
and he had explained it to me. Now, I knew, uh, or I knew a little bit about physician prescription writing, and I knew a little bit that physicians can write prescriptions, uh, there's nothing wrong with it, provided it's within the standard of care, to use a drug for a different use, but had never focused on off-label. And so he explained it to me. Um, and I had done some whistleblower cases in the past, and we went and did some research. He did not come to us thinking that he had a whistleblower case. He wanted to get out of the company, and he felt he was being pressured uh, by the company to, to do something illegal. So we did some research, uh, and we came up with this theory that, and very simply I'll say that, Medicaid will pay for certain drug uses. They, they pay for uh, medically accepted indications, and that's defined in the Medicaid statute as FDA-approved uses or uses that are supported by a, a citation in what's called the statutory compendia. And at the time, uh, there was U.S. Pharmacopeia, I think U.S. Uh, Hospital Formulary Service, uh, drug dex wasn't listed. These are compendia that the statute cites. Drug dex got added about a year later, and dr drug dex is very liberal in, in, in listing off-label uses. So we did some research, and we came up with this theory that this illegal marketing program was causing the government uh, to pay for uh, drug uses, neurotin drug uses, that were not reimbursable under the statute. Uh, there was no precedent for this theory. Um, and we did it. There's a statute called the False Claim Act. Uh, and it's been on the books, you know, since President Lincoln's administration. This is, I just wanted to show you, let me sidetrack for a minute. This is the document, internal document I referred to. So you see as of May of 94, they were projecting lifetime sales for Neurontin for $500 million. Again, this is Park Davis. Uh, it was owned by uh, Warner Lambert. Just to refresh your memory, Pfizer acquires Warner Lambert in June 2000. So we use the False Claim Act, federal statute, that allows any private individual uh, to bring a whistleblower case. They stand in the shoes of the government. They bring it in the name of the government. They're entitled uh, to a reward of anywhere from 15 to 30 percent of the settlement amount or the verdict amount if the case goes to trial. Uh, the statute was strengthened in 1986. It was beefed up recently in 2009. Senator Grassley is a real champion uh, of the statute, as is Re uh, Representative Waxman. Um, just in the past, uh, I think the past three, maybe four years, the government has uh, recovered about $6 billion in fraud cases on, under the statute. These complaints are filed under seal. So we filed the Franklin case in August 1996 under seal, again, in the name of the, uh, the government. And what happens is the government then will convene uh, a bunch of different representatives for a meeting from Department of Justice, from the local U.S. Attorney's Office, from the government agency involved here, uh, agents from the FDA. And they interview and debrief the relator, which is the word used in the statute. That's the plaintiff or the whistleblower. That was Dr. Franklin in this case. And then the government has 60 days to, to uh, intervene in the case, review all the evidence, and intervene. It's never long enough. They always have to ask for extensions of six months, sometimes a year. And they did that in the Franklin case while they continued to investigate the allegations that had been made in the complaint. The complaint remains under seal so that the defendant, um, in this case, uh, when we, we filed it, it was just against Warner Lambert and Park Davis because Pfizer hadn't acquired them yet. Uh, they want their investigation to remain uh, secret so the defendant doesn't know about it. Now, eventually, they start to subpoena or ask for uh, subpoena documents or ask for interviews of, of the defendant. So that's how they conduct their investigation. Then in December of 1999, they asked for more time. So it had been about three and a half years. And Judge Saris, who is the presiding judge on this case in Boston, said no. Um, then we, as private counsel, uh, can choose to walk away from the case or to uh, prosecute it on our own. And the government was having a problem with this case because there was no judicial precedent. Nobody had used the False Claim Act to go after a pharmaceutical company claiming that off-label promotion, which is illegal, it's a violation of the Food, Drug, and Cosmetic Act, uh, to use that as a basis to say that Medicaid is paying for drug uses it shouldn't be paying for. Um, there were other cases that said uh, if, if you 
uh, and they weren't against pharmaceutical companies, but it could be a fraud on the government if you presented claims, knowingly presented claims on the government, and got the government to pay for something that they don't intend to pay for. That could be fraud. Uh, but that wasn't enough for the government. They wouldn't, they wouldn't intervene in the case. Um, you want the government, as private counsel, you want the government to intervene in these cases because a couple things can happen. They can, well, first of all, it's the government intervening, and all the government resources then are brought to bear against a company, uh, uh, you know, like Warner Lambert. Um, I, I didn't want to have to take on Warner Lambert. You know, obviously, I don't, I don't have those resources. We're, we're a small firm. Um, so that's number one. Number two, the government can convene a criminal investigation. So what I've been talking to you about up till now is the civil case, all right? A key TAM case, a whistleblower case, a false claim act case. Those all kind of mean the same thing here. Uh, that's civil. But the, the government can con convene a criminal investigation, and they can have a, a grand jury convened, and they can present uh, uh, evidence to the grand jury. So that, that's a, a major club in these... Uh, False Claim Act cases, and you've probably read, uh, uh, you read the papers and you've read about a number of these cases uh, brought against the pharmaceutical industry and, and, and other industries as well, but it seems in the last few years there have been a lot reported uh, of successful government uh, settlements, global settlements of the civil case and the criminal case against pharmaceutical giants for fraudulent off-label marketing or fraudulent pricing of their drugs. The, the government didn't intervene, and so we started the, uh, the case in uh, active prosecution of it in June 2000. We went around the country, took depositions. Uh, we retained some experts, Dr. Landefeld and Mike Steinman from UCSF, uh, did some pro bono work for us uh, looking at the marketing documents. Uh, what we had to prove is we had to prove, you know, just I, I've mentioned to you that uh, promoting off-label is illegal. It's a violation of the Food, Drug, Cosmetic Act. The third thing I didn't tell you is there's no private right of enforcement. That means we couldn't bring the case against uh, Warner Lambert for violation of the Food, Drug, Cosmetic Act. The government could, but no private individual could. Uh, so that's why we used the False Claim Act. Uh, that gave us our cause of action, our, our claim against uh, the company. Uh, so we began an active prosecution of it, and uh, I'm going to I'm going to cover uh, about three or four years or five years in about two minutes, and just men mention two interesting things that that happened. Uh, I fought with uh, Warner Lambert and then with Pfizer over the scope of what's called the protective order. So you you ask for documents in a lawsuit, you ask for production of documents. Uh, you identify what you want; they're supposed to produce it. Before they do it, they, there's usually a protective order that's uh, negotiated between the parties that governs what's going to happen to the documents and who they can be shown to. And I fought with them for 14 months over this protective order because they wanted confidentiality of these documents. And I said, these documents aren't entitled, legally are not entitled to a confidentiality claim. They're stale marketing documents. And we fought and we fought. I saw some documents because they had to produce them, uh, even though we hadn't resolved the protective order. I agreed attorney's eyes only for the time being. And uh, then I was in touch with, um, well, NPR had done a story. NBC did a Dateline show on this that some of you might have seen, uh, the, the Globe and the, and the New York Times th you know, through their various reporters. And I said, you guys have to band together and get a law firm and have the law firm represent you because there are documents here that are claiming confidential I can't talk about, uh, but you should get access to these. And they did. They hired a law firm, and uh, we met, and we talked about a strategy, and then they filed a motion to unseal and get access to these documents. Pfizer opposed it. By now, Pfizer's in the case because we amended the complaint and added Pfizer because they had acquired Warner Lambert. So we had Warner Lambert still, Pfizer, and, and they fought us over this. And I filed a response to this motion to intervene. And I attached uh, a sampling of these so-called confidential documents that Judge Sarris could see them, had to file them under seal. Judge reviewed it. She said, these are not confidential documents. And she ordered Pfizer's counsel to go through all the boxes. <clears throat> I was telling Kay last night, I couldn't remember if it was 50 or 80 boxes, uh, but millions of pages of documents. They had to go through it in two weeks and redesignate them all. And then she turned to me and she said, Mr. Green, 
if you think they've over-designated confidentiality on this round, you file a Rule 11 motion, and I'll sanction them, and I'll award you attorney's fees. So she put, you know, this, this threat and some teeth into it. So now they went through, and uh, they were careful about what they designated confidential. Uh, still did some. And, and during this hearing, she had asked me, do you want to disclose these? And I said, yeah, there are issues of, of public interest here. The public has a right to, to know what's going on in the marketing of this drug. And it really was the first time in litigation that we, we had the internal marketing documents, the sales documents. It was the first time that this type of uh, documentation was going to be uh, made public, to my knowledge. I had never seen it. And uh, so we did. Over time, I would... Uh, I'd actually, you know, different media would want exclusivity, and I said, no, uh, everybody's going to get them at the so same time. And, and so there were a number of stories that were, were done about it. Um, all of this culminates in a settlement in May of 2004 of uh, $430 million, $152 million on the whistleblower case, the QI-TAM case. When I say QI-TAM, that's Q-U-I-T-A-M. It's a... It's a, it's a shorthand expression for a long Latin phrase uh, that means he who brings the action on behalf of the king. So I, I said at the outset, the, the king, yeah, I said at the, the outset um, that uh, this statute, our, our False Claim Act, uh, was on the books um, in President Lincoln's administration. That's true, but they got it from, from England because this uh, was a, 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 you could bring a writ a key tam in, in England if the, if the crown had been defrauded. Uh, so the key tam settled for $152 million, $240 million criminal fine. And the state uh, attorney general's offices, their consumer protection divisions, received $38 million. Now, let me, let me just see where I am in these slides. So this is interesting. I, I know the uh, – let me just go back for a minute. So some of you probably saw this title, and uh, you thought, oh, boy, snake oil. That's uh, And as I was taking the cab over here, I, I was trying to think of a word, K. To, that's, you know, sort of uh, not aggressive, not incendiary. Somebody can help me with a word, but uh, you think, oh, boy, uh, is that really true? Oops. What did I do here? So here's an email written by a Pfizer employee as of July uh, 1999. And now they were in the process of getting ready to acquire Warner Lambert. Remember, Warner Lambert owns Park Davis. So here it is. Gabapentin is the snake oil of the 20th century. And uh, now this guy, Mr. Wolberg, uh, appeared before the FDA and made a presentation back, I think it was 2008, do you recall when the uh, FDA was looking at Neurontin and a whole host of other drugs uh, because there had been a, a claim made that they uh, are associated with increased risk of depression, suicidal ideation, and suicide? And the FDA issued a report in May of 2000, I believe it's 2008, not 2009. I'm going to go with 2008, that made that finding. Um, now, it's not the first time the FDA... Uh, made that observation with regard to Neurontin. When the original uh, clinical trials were submitted to the FDA in 1992, they pointed out to Warner Lambert uh, that there were, uh, there were a number of patients in their studies uh, that had suicidal ideation, increased uh, depression. They approved the drug because it was for a very limited patient population. We're going to get to some internal documents uh, uh, in a little bit, but keep that in mind. As of 1992, 1993 time period, Warner Lambert, Park Davis was aware of what the FDA had informed them about, increased risk of depression and suicidal ideation. Just a little factoid here. Uh, so you can see the top selling drugs, and here are two years, in 2003 and 2004, that Neurontin, um, Neurontin exceeds $2 billion in sales. And again, the vast majority of those sales are for off-label uses. I'll show you a chart in a little bit where you'll see what the off-label usage was. 
Well, here, here's one chart. Now, this is, let me just take a minute. Now, this data, it's all from IMS. This data we have, uh, obtained during the litigation. But the, the green is the on label. And you'll see there it says, if you can read it, it says epilepsy and PHN. Now, that's a post-herpetic neuralgia. So it was approved, remember, December 93, uh, adjunctive therapy for epilepsy, then May of 2002 for the management of post-herpetic neuralgia, shingle pain. And uh, Pfizer used that to try to market it for neuropathic pain uh, diabetic peripheral neuropathy. They did some trials. They suppressed negative trial results. We're going to get to that in a minute. That was the, the Kaiser trial. Keep in mind that I said we filed Franklin case in 1996. The case settled in May 2004. But the documents that were produced in that litigation were only for the period of 1994 and 1998, through 1998. And you might ask why. Well, we tried to get documents earlier than 94 and after 1998. Now, the magistrate who, who, who addresses uh, discovery disputes, he gave us one year. Judge Saris gave us four years. But we wanted to go back and get information uh, when they were developing a neuron and get their internal documents and emails if they had them. I don't think they had them at that time, but internal documents, uh, because that's where, you know, emails are great, and internal documents and memos are great. That's where you get your evidence of fraud. Or if you get access to the research reports, as, as Kay had, uh, um, and it, we'll see that in a, in a few minutes. So there's the skyrocketing uh, off-label use. And if you can see, we're, we're starting on this axis, 1994. And remember, it's approved. They, they launched first quarter in 94. And you can see how the, the on-label use, represented by the green, remains you know, fairly, fairly stable. But look what happens to, I don't know if you can see it, but... The, the orange is all pain, psychiatric, and migraine combined. And then we, the blue is all, all other indications. Uh, this was just the daily dose. I, I want to skip through this. Uh, maybe the point of this slide is the FDA approved dose of 1,800 milligrams per day, you know, for, uh, for epilepsy, adjunctive therapy for epilepsy. Twice, um, Park Davis submitted... Uh, applications to raise the, the dose, and twice they were shot down. Twice they were told your clinical data doesn't demonstrate any greater efficacy above 1,800. And uh, that's going to become important in a moment. So here, just uh, let's sum up. We talked about the whistleblower case, when it was filed, what it settled for. So there we are. There's a lot of uh, publicity being generated uh, as uh, news as the media writes about the case, leading up to the settlement, documents are disclosed, and then the settlement. So what happens? A number of uh, lawsuits are filed around the country, uh, more than 100, seeking class certification for a consumer class or class certification for a third-party payer class. These were literally filed all around the country. In addition to that, there were um, a number of cases that were filed called drug product liability cases. And in those cases, the claim was that Neurontin caused uh, a patient to commit suicide or to attempt suicide. And there, there may have been, uh, I'm going to say, approximately 1,000 of those cases uh, filed. Uh, I wasn't involved in any of those cases, nor was I involved in the filing of these cases seeking class certification. Um, then what happened is uh, some lawyers started to contact me and ask me if I would. The, the cases seeking class for certification, here, here was the theory there. Uh, th this drug was ineffective. Or strike th This drug was being sold off label. We want our money back. That's what the lawyers thought the, the theory of recovery there was. Well, th there is no theory of recovery un under that claim. The fraud claim in the whistleblower case was that this illegal marketing, off-label marketing, caused the government to pay for something it didn't intend to pay for. That's the government's claim. Aetna or Kaiser couldn't bring a claim and say, this is off-label, uh, we want our money back. They couldn't do that because their 
They're physicians write off label, and it's okay for physicians to write off label. The FDA is not going to get involved in, in the practice of medicine. Uh, um, anyway, I had, a, you know, I had a number of visits and, and got persuaded to, to, to get involved, and all these cases were consolidated by what's called the multi district litigation panel and transferred to Boston to Judge Saris, who was the judge in, in the Naranton case. Um, and then the case starts all over again, meaning there's all this discovery. And so now this case goes on from 2004, uh, culminating, it's not over yet, but culminating in this jury verdict, uh, the Kaiser verdict of, in March 2010. So what happened, let's talk a little bit about what happened in this period of time from, uh, let's call it September 2004, when the cases were all consolidated, all these cases seeking class action certification. Now, some of you, maybe all of you have heard about class actions. Um, up to this point, I was never involved in one. We do, we do complex civil litigation, but my firm wouldn't be considered a class action firm. Uh, No, uh, no attorney is going to take a lawsuit on behalf of a consumer who spent $1,000 for Neurontin or $2,500 for Neurontin um, and try to get their money back. It's not going to happen. Uh, no consumer claims when the money uh, is, is the damages involved with that small are going to be brought and prosecuted on a, on a single basis. A class of action is an appropriate vehicle uh, for that type of litigation if there's been fraud if, if there's a, an appropriate claim to be made. Um, <clears throat> with regard to the third party payer, those were the, that was the other group that was trying to get class action certification. So for example, uh, Aetna um, or Blue Cross uh, would, would file a case uh, or a small little health plan, uh, a union funded health plan might, might, might file a case, but their damages might be too small. So they seek class certification. And it's the lawyers that are filing these complaints that are uh, seeking class certification. And as, as I say, maybe a single health plan would be too small. But if you can get a critical mass of them, uh, then the ja da damages would be significant enough to warrant prosecution of the case. And you know, I began working on now the second case in September of 2004. And I worked on it. Again, we're a small firm, but we worked on it, uh, you know, right up through the, the Kaiser trial, which ended in uh, March of 2010. Now, we sought class certification for consumer class and third-party payer class, and we were twice denied class certification by Judge Saris. And here's why. The defense in the case, um, I, I'm going to try to make this very, very simple. A lot, a lot of defenses, a lot of arguments, but it was... It's a requirement that if you want to get a class certified, you have to show that the claims are uniform for the whole group that you're trying to certify the class for. And so let's, let's talk about consumer pharmaceutical uh, uh, fraud. How, how are you going to prove that a fraudulent misrepresentation that we make to Dr. Dickerson, uh, the question is, did she rely on that? So we say Neurontin is effective for migraine. Or we send her a standard response letter where we omit the negative trial result, the clinical trial we conducted, and we say, you know, it, it, it's good for migraine. Um, or the sales rep vi visits Dr. Dickerson and hands out a, a journal article that describes uh, its effectiveness for migraine, but the journal article doesn't disclose the negative clinical trials that they have back in, 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 uh, in their storeroom. Now... Dr. Dickerson might testify, well, I did rely on what the sales rep said. But this physician over here might say, well, I learned the information at Grand Rounds. And this physician over here might say, well, I went to a CME. CME. And this physician over here might say, well, you know, anticonvulsants are sometimes used for relief of, of migraine or pain or something. So I, I never heard anything about Neurontin. So they tried to defend or defeat, prevent the case from getting uh, certified by saying, um, we are entitled to be able to ex uh, examine, depose every treating physician for the consumers uh, to see what they relied upon. And 
during the period of, let's say, 2000, approximately 2005 you know, to 2007 or 8, there were a series of court of appeal decisions around the country that came down in these class action cases which found that the defendants should be allowed to examine physicians and that will defeat certification because now individual inquiry uh, will predominate. So the class is not one whole group with one common question of fact or law, all right? Um, so we, we have a motion for reconsideration. You know, three strikes are out, all right? So <laughs> we're seeking reconsideration for a bipolar class only, and we'll come to this in a minute, why? why. Um, now, in November 2009, Judge Saris, who was sitting on the motion for reconsideration, said, look, I want to have a bellwether trial. Um, so she selected the Kaiser case. Kaiser is the largest private health plan in the country. There were, there were two named plaintiffs here, Kaiser uh, Health Plan and Kaiser, I think it's Kaiser Health Foundation. Um, they're California-based, and they asked my firm uh, to try the case. Uh, to, to assist a couple of the lawyers and try the case. Uh, I, I might say during the – from 2004 to 2006, I mentioned we did the discovery. So you might say, well, what does that mean? Now we had access to documents. Uh, we went back to 1994 to 98. Remember, that was the, the Franklin period, uh, the whistleblower case. We went back and tried to get more documents in that period. But now we wanted 1998 up to the present date, and I believe we got 1998 up to 2004. The cases were, you know, consolidated as of 2004. J Judge Sarris, a very, very bright woman, a very fair woman, and uh, uh, she gave both parties, you know, fair hearings on all the contested motions. Uh, we did, I don't know, 40 or 50 depositions, and we retained a lot of experts. Now, what do we have to prove? And, and I have about 12 minutes till 1 o'clock, and we'll see where we are then, because Depending where I am here, I might want to just break for the questions. We had to prove fraud. And it's not enough to prove off-label. Remember I said there's no private right of action under the Food, Drug, Cosmetic Act. So these complaints sounded in, in, in fraud. And the two claims in the Kaiser case were under the RICO statute, which is a federal statute, and under a California state statute. Kaiser was able to sue under the California state statute. As I said, they're from California. That was an unfair competition law. In the RICO case, that RICO is R-I-C-O, and it, st it stands for Racketeer Influenced and Corrupt Organization Act. It's a federal statute. Uh, you know, there, there's volumes and volumes on this RICO jurisprudence, so we're not really going to go into it here. But basically... Uh, it was uh, a fraud-based RICO claim, and the claim was that they used the mail and the, and the wires uh, to misrepresent Neurontin's efficacy for four uh, unapproved uses, bipolar disorder, migraine, neuropathic pain, and doses uh, above 1,800 milligrams a day. So we had to prove uh, that Neurontin was ineffective for those indications. They knew it was ineffective, and they um, either suppressed information regarding its ineffectiveness or they misrepresented information regarding its effectiveness. And it depended upon the indication. But lumping them all together, they had conducted, uh, both Warner Lambert and, and Pfizer had conducted clinical trials, scientific clinical trials, double-blind, randomized, placebo-controlled trials that showed Neurontin was ineffective. And they either outright suppressed them, six of them for uh, nociceptive pain. They delayed publication of them, two uh, uh, or three for uh, diabetic peripheral neuropathy. Uh, migraine, they were aware of and, and suppressed uh, a, one negative tr trial result uh, of, of a company that uh, they acquired. Um, and the doses I mentioned, they, they knew, and they twice went to the FDA and tried to get it approved for doses above 1,800 milligrams, and the FDA shot them down. Said, your own clinical trials shows uh, no greater efficacy above 1,800. Nevertheless, they promoted it as effective uh, for, for neuropathic pain. And bipolar disorder. Um, they had a uh, study they did for bipolar disorder, 
and they delayed publication of that study, and they were aware of other negative studies, and they never provided that information in journal articles. So how did they get this fraudulent message out? They did it through a number of different vehicles, CME, teleconferences, consultant meetings, advisory boards. Now, some of you may be physicians. Some of you may sit on advisory boards. Some of you may have been to consultant meetings. And, and you might say there's a legitimate purpose uh, in an advisory board, and I would agree. There is a legitimate purpose to, for a pharmaceutical company to have an advisory board. But when you start to have advisory boards several times a year in every major city around the country, you're not really looking for advice from your advisors. But you, you recognize that these people you invite to be your advisors are key opinion leaders, uh, KOLs. And it's the key opinion leaders that they, they count on to, uh, uh, to, to help uh, generate their sales. Now, you might say, well, what's the basis for this? Well, we had their internal uh, Excel spreadsheets that showed their advertising and promotion. Uh, and we, it showed their strategy to grow emerging uses off-label. And it showed the tactics that they were going to implement uh, to grow uh, the off-label use. And as I mentioned, they hired an advertising company, Klein Davis Mann out of New York. And they hired another company, Medical Action Communication, Inc., which was a medical writing firm, to assist them in uh, implementing the strategy. Let me, let me just try to – some of this I've talked about. So just give me one second, and let's see where we are here. And uh, – Well, this was a question I was actually going to ask you. You know, what do you look for? What do you, uh, in the medical community, what sources do you turn to when, when you're looking for evidence, when you, you're practicing evidence-based medicine? Uh, the two themes we had here in this trial were evidence-based medicine versus marketing-based medicine. And marketing-based medicine is what this pharmaceutical company, both of these companies were engaged in. Um, they would elevate uh, anecdotal reports above DBRCTs. Um, they, would, uh, they would promote using open label studies and suppress the blinded studies. You, you may know the Corcoran Collaborative. Uh, the Corcoran Collaborative was making inquiry. We'll see an internal document where they wouldn't release evidence to, to Cochrane uh, about their, their drug uh, bipolar. Finally, neurons use in treating bipolar. Finally, uh, Cochrane gave, gave up with it. But my, my, my point here is that the pharmaceutical industry, and I know we're here, we're talking about these two cases with Pfizer, and I saw it in these two cases, that they, they infiltrate um, all of these different vehicles, these sources that the health community the healthcare community, physicians, rely upon to get information. And you might say, you, you pick up an article in the New England Journal of Medicine or some other prestigious publication, and it's reporting the results of a, a DBRCT. And they have, let's say they have a disclosure there that the authors, uh, maybe they did uh, work for the drug company. You might even recognize some of their names, or you say they're from a prestigious institution, or, or, or maybe you don't. Uh, but whatever journals you read, how do you know that what's being reported to you, I mean, how would you really check that what's being reported to you is, you know, the complete and accurate representation of, of the scientific study? How would you know that? Well, what we did in this case is we got 20 trials and research reports from these four different indications, and we gave them to Dr. Dickerson. Now, I had never met Dr. Dickerson, um, but we're introduced uh, to her through, I think, Dr. Landefeld and Lisa Barrow and, and, and Dr. Steinman, and, uh, and spoke her on the phone, and she invited me down. Uh, and I know <laughs> Kay comes from New England. She doesn't want me to mention any of this, but just very quickly, she uh, grew up in Milton, Massachusetts, which is a town I, I live in. And so anyway, I mentioned that. Maybe that helped me get my foot in the door. But I, I came down, and I... I uh, now, I'm going to sound like the drug representative. But I hope you don't mind what I said. But I got a little old book of photos uh, of the town of Milton and, and brought them down and gave them to Kay. And uh, I got you that little uh, paperweight from Milton Academy. Uh, <laughs> uh, but I, I didn't know Kay, and, but I knew of her reputation. 
and we we had about thirteen or fourteen experts, all very highly qualified. Dr. Kessel, the former commissioner of the FDA, testified for us. He was one of our experts. But Dr. Dickerson looked at the twenty research reports. So what she had access to, and and, and her colleague uh, Swarup, um, they had access to the protocol which you wouldn't see if you're reading your journal article. They had access to the internal research report. Again, you don't see that. And then they were able to compare that with what was written in the journal article. And uh, what Dr. Dickerson found and what, and what she testified to, you know, they couldn't match. With all the money Pfizer had, they couldn't match uh, with an expert that, was, that had Dr. D uh, Dickerson's credentials or credibility. And she had never testified for, for an attorney before. And, uh, uh, and I asked her why she did in, in, in the case, and she said because people needed to know what had happened here. And she didn't accept any payment uh, for her testimony. Uh, and she and Swarup did so much work in this case. But they compared the internal research report with what was written. And what was written was not what had occurred when you looked at the research report. So when I say we had to demonstrate that the drug was ineffective, we had specialists in migraine, uh, bipolar disorder, uh, dose, biostatistician from Berkeley. Um, so they, they also looked at the, the clinical trials done in each one of those indications and compared them to what, uh, what was written. And they, they focused their opinion. Part of their opinion was just the, the study in saying, does it dis demonstrate efficacy? Uh, now, Pfizer had a whole slew of experts, matched our experts, expert for expert. Uh, and, you know, as, as you can see, the jury concluded that the drug was ineffective uh, for these four indications. They awarded a verdict of about $42 million, and that verdict just got trebled last week. I think it was last week or the week before uh, when the judge, remember I said the statute requires uh, tripling of, of, of the verdict, so it's about $147 million. Um, the judge makes findings of fact and conclusions of law under the California statute because that's not a jury claim. But in our case, the judge took an advisory verdict from the jury on the California statute. Again, remember, it's an unfair competition law. Basically, fraud. Uh, and the jury found that Pfizer violated that statute. And the judge issued uh, her findings, 146 pages, of very detailed findings of fact and conclusions of law, and she awarded $95 million. Now, you don't get both. You've got to elect either the 147 or the $95 million. The status of the case is that it will uh, it'll go up on, uh, up on appeal. It was the first time that a pharmaceutical company was found um, liable for violation of RICO on a fraud-based claim. Uh, and uh, let me just try to... I didn't do this. Somebody in my office did this, but they, <laughs> they, they like animation. So. so here we are. This says 19, but it was 20. Those are the trials. Now, when I first uh, met with Dr. Dickerson, she talked about, you know, publication bias in its various forms and that when you had, had publication bias, it could constitute scientific misconduct. And, and I being, uh, you know, not a science person, but, but a lawyer, and I think of fraud, and I want to talk about fraud, you know, misrepresentation and, and fraud. And uh, so that's what the jury, the jury found. Um, they, they found fraud. They found that Pfizer had engaged in all of this scientific misconduct and that that was fraud. That was a violation of RICO. And the judge confirmed that with her finding on the, the California statute. So this is going into uh, too much detail now, um, but these, these slides are going to be here. So this was, we, we talked about this, bipolar disorder. And uh, these quotes are from the FDA. Um, and when you see source, it says Pfizer L. Uh, Alps. That's a Pfizer employee. He was deposed, and that's a document, that Bates number. Um, that's a document they produced, and it's the FDA uh, report when the 
when Warner Lambert submitted the initial clinical trial results, uh, when they were when they were trying to get Neurontin approved, uh, you know, for epilepsy. Now we, we touched on this a little bit, but let, let me just click on here. Uh, so look at the date of this. This is an internal uh, email. This is Dr. Pandy Atul A T U L Pandy. He writes writes this to, to uh, John Boris. And uh, so here it is. It's uh, March of 95. Keep in mind what the FDA has said about associated risk of, of, of depression, suicide. And he's working on study plans in psychiatry. And if you go down a little bit further, obviously the object of a publication strategy would be to disseminate the information as widely as possible through the world's medical literature. Now, this guy is a psychiatrist. At the time, he's a Warner Lambert, Park Davis employee, and he stayed on when Pfizer acquired them. Uh, he conducts his own uh, clinical trial on bipolar disorder. It's negative. The results are known as of July of 98. He writes to his co-investigators, but they don't publish it until 2000. No mention here of what the FDA has observed. So what do they do? They approve a publication strategy. I think you know, publication strategy versus registration stra strategy. Registration means go to the FDA, do it the right way. Publication strategy, a lot cheaper. Let's, let's do a clinical trial. Might be an open label clinical trial. And let's, let's circulate, uh, disseminate the message in, in, in journal articles. They also file uh, for, uh, to get a patent approved. Dr. Pandy does that for neurontin use in treating a mood disorder. And they issue a marketing assessment. They did it for neuropathic pain. They did it for migraine. They did it for bipolar disorder. And they say, we're going uh, to conduct a publication strategy and publish the results if positive. Here's their, here's their markup. Uh, this is uh, their preliminary marketing assessment. But you see how they were using the word off-label? That might be kind of hard for you to see, but see here, and, and uh, they knew, well, we've got to be careful about that off-label, and uh, it's overall conclusions and recommendations. Um, so th this one here is for psychiatric disorders. Now, they clean this up. They take off uh, off-label. They end up using the word unapproved. And, uh, you know, there's so many things I could tell you about these marketing assessments, including a call I got in the middle of the night from John Boris, who no, never, one of the authors of these marketing assessments, who no longer worked for them. And I had been trying to track him down. And he left me a voicemail and said, all you need to know is in the marketing assessments. Look to the marketing assessments. They'll tell you everything. And uh, I had talked to his wife and left her a message, several messages, and, and then... Uh, this was during the Franklin case, and he went on to work with, uh, I think it was Merrill Lynch, and I showed up in his office one day in New York. I was there for a deposition, and, and uh, he, I, let's say I surprised him, but he, he, wouldn't, he wouldn't talk to me. He was ultimately deposed in the case, and it was difficult for him to explain away these recommendations. This, uh, this is the patent we talked about. You see here... Uh, Dr. Pandy filing the Patent and Trademark Office here, U.S. Patent. And th this is for treatment of a mania and bipolar disorder. Again, 1996. So they're patenting it. He wants to develop. They do a marketing assessment. Uh, they want to develop for psychiatric uses. They know what the FDA has said. Uh, the novel use for gabapentin, which would not be obvious. Uh, Prophylactic use of oh I'm sorry of uh, this last sentence. Prophylactic use of gabapentin for bipolar disorder is also taught. Now this is what the marketing assessment, the cleaned up copy look like. This is just a couple things we lifted it, but uh, this I've mentioned the results if positive. So again, this is their publication strategy. They're gonna they're gonna publish the results and. This was bipolar indications. Again, this is IMS data showing the use. 
So you can see here there's, there's, uh, there's no use, and then they start their marketing. What we did here is we took the different vehicles they use for, um, to get the message out. These all come from their internal documents. So, for example, 90 dinner meetings and seminars and 95,000 supplements mailed. This is all touting Neurontin's use for bipolar. 100 CMEs during this period of time, these congresses, advisory board, teleconferences, consult meetings, and you can see the use growing. Now, this is not proving causation. This is just sh showing an association between marketing uh, through these vehicles and the use of Neurontin for bipolar growing. I really am running out of time, but see this article, February 1996. This was written by Dr. Pandy and a couple other employees in Neurontin, and they talk about Neurontin's use and its, its effect on mood and well-being. So they say it has a beneficial effect on mood. Again, look, 1996, no mention. This is the abstract, but there was an article. No mention about the FDA findings of increased risk of depression, suicidal ideation, and it being approved for a limited patient population. Those are just the points I, I, I made. So I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to just skip and see if I can come to some. This is bipolar. We talked about this. This is just showing uh, an article that Pandy wrote on social phobia and bipolar. This was based on a clinical trial positive. This is a negative. Study completed May 97, submit 98, published 99, 97, not published to 2000. Journal it's sent to, 450 circulation. Journal sent to, 8,000. Copies mailed by Park Davis, 25,000. Copies given to sales reps, 125,000. None mailed, none given to sale rep. This is the negative study. What does Pandy say to explain the negative study? He says it's at odds with the, the numerous clinical reports, anecdotal evidence, level three evidence. This is just his letter. Uh, this is a letter to a Kaiser doctor. So Kaiser calls them and asks, what do you have on bipolar disorder? They don't tell of, of the negative studies. They ask, what do you have on, on neurotin, excuse me, neuropathic pain? they don't get some of the negative information. Am, am I going too fast or I, I do want to leave. It's almost 10 after. I think maybe I ought to stop and take your questions. And I, I'm sorry, that there's more I want to do, but uh, this will give us at least 10 minutes. Yes. He, I think he wants the. Did you want the slides, sir? No. Yeah, he well, wants the, the slides. The podcast will be up. You are. Yes. I thought it was just recently, like in the past year and a half, that now the FDA or the law allows pharmaceutical companies to pass out articles from these journals for not for unapproved uses. Is that true? I'm a little. Yeah, so the, I don't have the exact date, but there are different FDA guidances over time on this subject. There was litigation with the Washington Legal Foundation. The pharmaceutical industry was claiming they have a First Amendment right to be able to disseminate the journal articles that describe off-label uses. The FDA came up with a, a, a guidance, uh, let's say, in the last few years that, that allowed this. Uh, and uh, so, so that is true. But there's no right to disseminate a journal article that has a false and misleading statement about a drug. And uh, so remember, the Franklin case, the first case we talked about, was off-label promotion causing the government to pay for something it didn't pay for. We, and, and that's considered fraud on the government. But we weren't look, we didn't have access to the internal research reports. We didn't have access to documents a very limited period of time. So 
that, that the proof in that case was different than the proof in this Kaiser trial. We got a lot more information. Now we had to prove fraud. So um, we couldn't say that they disseminated an article that said it's effective for, for bipolar. That wouldn't be actionable. You'd have to show that they, there, was, there was fraud involved. So there's either an affirmative misrepresentation of the study results or this suppression of negative clinical data. You know, keep in mind that a pharmaceutical company has no duty. Um, they have no duty to disclose their negative trial results until they open their mouths to say something about that drug use, that drug's use. Then they have a duty. So if I, have a, if I do a DBRCT or, and, or I have any evidence that the, the drug is ineffective or unsafe, and, and I conceal it, uh, and then I take this evidence and I say, look, we have these reports from physicians, case reports appearing in the literature. It's effective to treat this condition. I, I've got to be fair and balanced. I've got to disclose the negative once I open my mouth to speak about it. So you are right about the off-label, but keep in mind what we're talking about now, the second case, is fraudulent off-label promotion for these four indications. Yes? So I want to explore this difference uh, you know, sort of the, the freedom allowed to individual physicians to make decisions versus what the company is allowed to do or say. So there's actually there's a case that I know of where the, uh, a study was published where the, one of the main endpoints uh, was not quite significant. And the company then went and marketed the drug on the basis of saying, well, in a sense, it's enough evidence for any physician to prescribe it. And in fact, on a one-on-one -on -one basis, arguably, it was a very bad disease, you know, outcome was survival. So in that situation, are they liable by, by saying that this is, in a sense, sufficient evidence, even though it's in some formal sense un un unproven, uh, by conveying this information accurately, pushing it hard and getting people to prescribe it, are they misrepresenting that data? Or are they allowing physicians to make, uh, you know, one-on-one -on -one considered judgments? You know, um, I, I don't think I have enough information. So l let, me, let me ask a couple questions. So yes, they can do clinical trials. We've seen this where the, the, the endpoints are switched. The primary endpoint is negative. The secondary endpoint is positive. Yeah. They switch them. They, they, they report the trial as effective, and they report the, the secondary uh, outcome is, is the one being studied, no mention of, of the primary. If you looked at the protocol, you would have seen. If that's the situation. No, the uh, situation is the, the, the secondary was indeed the primary one, but they reported as the secondary. It says negative on the primary, positive on the secondary, but that's. That, would, that should be what's important to everybody, and therefore you should uh, prescribe. Okay. Actually, all the they disclosed all the information. So this, yeah, the point is okay. they disclosed the information, but they interpreted it in a way that was very, uh, you know, uh, generous okay. to themselves, and they say that, well, this is up to physicians to decide. All right, so now, uh, so you have full disclosure of yeah. negative and positive, so no, no fraud there. You say they, 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 uh, they disclosed the, the positive in a way that was more favorable. So long as that wasn't spun to the point where it's fraud, let's assume it wasn't, uh, then my next question is, okay, um, is, it, is it on label or off label? Off label. Okay. Uh, so we would assume that uh, if there's no fraud involved and if the FDA under this guidance is permitting them uh, in a journal article to discuss this off-label use, uh, it's, it's probably acceptable. It's probably not actionable because you, you've, you've asked me to assume that there's no fraud. There's no suppression of a negative endpoint. There's no spinning uh, of, of, of an endpoint to the point where it would, it would constitute fraud. There's, there's no... Uh, well, spinning in the sense that it, it's a difference between the criteria that an individual physician might use and what the FDA might do. So there's no question that the trial was not, you know, did not have, was, was not proven. I, I, I guess what I'm saying is, can, can the company use the 
individual physician discretion argument to say, you know, our marketing efforts simply inform the doctors to allow them to make their own judgments. And obviously they pushed it very, very hard, as Kylie suggested, even though they said, you know, well, maybe the FDA wouldn't accept it, but, you know, you're an individual doctor. You know, this should be enough for you. Yeah. Well, they can't market or promote an off-label use. I mean, that's what they're doing with the journal article. Now, they will sit down there in a deposition and say, no, I'll argue their point. No, we're just informing the medical community so the medical community can take care of their patients. Right. That's sort of where we're exploring. Yeah, that's. What's the dividing line between, quote, unquote, informing aggressively and marketing? Yeah. You need, okay, so marketing, promotion, you can't do that. So if you now had your sales force armed with those journal articles and you had them discussing off-label uses with the doctor, this could fall over the line and be promotion. Or if you had some internal documents, and these documents exist, but you don't see them and I don't see them unless we get them through litigation. But you just showed an example like that with bipolar and Tandy in that I don't think that the often it was surprising, like one of the Tandy articles just was blatantly about negative results. But when it's part of a whole, that's when you see how they're sort of setting up a situation for themselves, like, well, they're explaining away a negative finding or they're not handing out the negative results, they're just handing out the ones that. So it's more part of a whole, at least what I saw. Yeah. Let me follow up Kay's thing, which may be related to what you say. So they did a, Dr. Gorson did a trial on diabetic peripheral neuropathy. It was negative. He wanted to publish the results. They wouldn't publish the results as a written journal article. And then they did the Baconia trial, which also was diabetic peripheral neuropathy. And they published those results in JAMA. And then they had a nationwide marketing strategy where they created 85 or 95 million media impressions around the country through ads and journal articles about Neurontin and about DPN. And Gorson was resorted to get his, he wrote a letter to the editor, and that's how his results got published. Then they had a Reckless trial, which was the biggest study for, Dr. Reckless, that was his name, the biggest study for DPN. And that was negative. And if we went through this, you'd see some e-mails saying we've got to delay publication of this. We don't want people to get access to this. I think that was one maybe Cochran was trying to get some of the data. And so they waited for, I forget how many years before they published Dr. Reckless's results, but they buried it on the ninth page of a non-systematic review article. The article concludes that Neurontin is effective for diabetic peripheral neuropathy. So they never wrote it up as a full journal article. Yes? I think you've got to be a little more careful, though, about delays in publication and impugning some sort of motive. Because I've been involved in trials, not drug company sponsored, where you had to submit, go to five different journals before it gets published. So in other words, the time between results and publication, I don't know that I'd necessarily draw lots of conclusions from that, because that depends on a whole host of factors. And one would want to know in that argument as to whether or not they submitted before or whatever. Yeah. There's a lot of things that go into that. I think you're right. You don't want to just jump to the conclusion. Because there's a delay, you want to impugn an improper motive because of it. And we didn't have to do that in this case. There was plenty of internal documents and discussion amongst the employees about not wanting to publish negative results and delaying negative results. You know, the POP trial was another diabetic peripheral neuropathy trial. POP, P-O-P-P was the name of that trial. And they suppressed that for seven years before they allowed publication of the results. And it was after the Neurontin patent had expired. And there was no longer any negative commercial ramification to publication of those results. But I don't mean to suggest that a delay or a year or two years. You know, it can be just the process of getting something to publication. And we were very careful. And Dr. Dickerson was very careful. Actually, 
The reason I can say that is because Dr. Dickerson told me that at the, at the first meeting. So <laughs> she set me uh, on, the, on the right course. I, I thought, well, look, it's, it's, you know, it's a year, it's a year and a half, and uh, she told me we needed more. So thank you for reminding me. But I, I didn't mean to be suge suggesting that. Yes? Yes, that's a very good observation. And Dr. Dickerson did do that. And I think you know, but I'm, I'm, I'm going to remind you that Swaroop and Dr. Dickerson uh, wrote an article uh, about their work in this case that was you know, peer-reviewed and published in the New England Journal of Medicine in November of 2009. And you might want to, if you haven't had an opportunity to read that article, you might want to take a look at it. It's a very thoughtful, thorough evaluation of all the, the clinical evidence in this case. Um, and I say, I know I'm going to embarrass Dr. Dickerson here, but you should have heard her testimony. Um, and I, no, I have to, I have to say this because I did say it to her afterwards. You know, I, I've been trying cases for 30 years, and I've had a lot of different experts. I never had anybody, and I, I was a little bit nervous about this being recorded about having Dr. Dickerson testify because she had never testified before, and. Uh, and she was going to be cross-examined, you know, by these guys. And I never had, uh, I never saw an expert uh, withstand cross-examination like Dr. Dickerson did. So, more questions? Yes. Do you think in the last 15 years the industry has done careful or better? You know, that, that, that's difficult to say. If, if you follow the accounts in the press, you, you'd think, well, they, they're getting worse because t talking about the pharmaceutical industry now as opposed to healthcare industry, there have been a lot of reports of settlements in these cases. Uh, they recover, uh, you know, the government recovering lot, lots of money from the various uh, manufacturers. But those cases, um, a lot of them had been under seal uh, for years. So the conduct might go back to 2002, 2003, 2004. Um, they're careful, but you know, one thing we, we say about these, um, these types of cases is that the fraud continues. And how are you going to stop this fraud? Because I, I believe that manufacturers look at this. They, they may not admit this, but they look at it as a cost of business. So they paid $430 million for the global settlement in Franklin. And I haven't paid yet, but let's assume they're going to pay $147 million to settle the Kaiser case. But they made, you know, maybe $10 billion in sales, in the rotten sales over the period of time. So uh, they, they, they've made out, and it's, it's true with all these manufacturers. So how are we going to stop this type of conduct, assuming, assuming that this is fraud, as we've demonstrated in this case? And I think what has to be done is that someone has to be account held accountable uh, for more than just monetary damages. And if someone can be criminally charged, and if someone is going to go to prison, and when I say someone, I'm not talking about a low-level employee, a sales rep for promoting off-label, but I'm talking about upper-level management executives being held ac accountable and sentenced and spending some time in jail, this conduct will stop. Um, and, and recently, there was the government indicted an in-house attorney at Glaxo uh, who was involved in, and I don't have all the, all the facts, but was involved in um, off-label, reviewing some documents concerning off-label use of the drug. And uh, that, that attorney has been indicted, which is, is unusual. I know there was another case in New York where a doctor was, a doctor was indicted for being involved in uh, a physician for off-label, being involved in off-label promotion for, for a, drug, a drug company. But to me, that's not the way to do it. The way to stop the conduct is don't go after the customers, the, the physicians. Go after the executives. More questions? Did I miss one? Yes. Yeah. Uh, yes, yeah. So
So this started off, the first inquiry started off, yours about off-label use, journal article, can they hand them out? And I, you know, I haven't looked at this FDA guidance you're referring to in a, in a little while, but um, I think they are allowed to circulate a journal article that discusses a clinical trial uh, involving an off-label use of a drug. Uh, now I'm talking about a legitimate you know, trial, or, uh, no fraud involved. I think and I just haven't looked at it, so I probably shouldn't say, but I, I think the, the sales rep can, I think, can drop the article but can't discuss it. But if it's discussing off-label use of the drug, and it's obviously favorable or they wouldn't be handing it out, and your latest, this question is, but they have negative information, do they have to disclose it? And the answer would be yes. Uh, so if you had, let's say you're disclosing anecdotal reports, you know, and it was just a case report. Well, you should be disclosing your negative case reports, but if you're disclosing a clinical trial result and you have a negative clinical trial result, once you open your mouth, you have a duty to, to tell the good and the bad about the drug. Did somebody help? No. Any more? Okay. Oh, okay. Thank you. Oh, okay.